Good morning. My name is Mike Scriber. I'm a senior director at Supermicro, and I've been developing and designing NVMe storage systems for just about four years for Supermicro and with some other companies prior to that. Today, I want to talk to you about what's going on with NVMe. And I know that that is a really, really broad, broad topic. So I'll narrow it down a little bit, but what I really want to cover today is our industry pace, where NVMe growth is taking place. I want to talk about more is better, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. Then I want to talk to, about where EDSFF is going. We'll touch on QLC and where that's at. Explain a little bit why NVMe over fabric is so important. And I'm going to wrap the whole thing up with GPU Direct and talk about that. So first of all, if you're like me developing systems, we are driving fast and hard. Super hard, super fast. We're on that treadmill. We're trying to go, 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 go. And, and, and that's great, but it seems like sometimes our customers, well, they're kind of at their own pace. Now, we certainly have some customers that are right there with us. They can hardly wait to the latest and greatest um, next CPU comes out or the next big system or the next big drive or whatever um, the case may be. But we also have other customers that kind of, well, they're not really cutting edge. And, and one of the things about Supermicro is we're very much cutting edge. Um, we've been doing NVMe systems for well over six years now. We've been doing it from the very beginning. We've got well over 150 systems that are, that are NVMe, that support NVMe. So we're like cutting edge, doing EDSFF, doing all the great stuff. Some of our customers are like, yeah, not quite there. Let me give you an example. We have one customer, I love this customer, they're a fantastic customer of ours. But, but it's interesting with them because just this year, they have decided to go from one gigabit ethernet all the way to 10 gigabit ethernet. And, and I just have to chuckle to myself and go, wow, that's so 15 years ago. But for them, that internet, that ethernet is just not super important. But I'll tell you what, they squeeze every ounce of power out of that processor. They tweak that absolutely to the hill to get every ounce of power they can out of the processor. So just different customers are different. And, and different customers aren't necessarily ready for the next cutting edge. And there's a couple reasons for that, I think. And one of them is, is I think some customers kind of feel like it's science fiction. Now, science fiction, it, it, it kind of depends, right? I mean, back in the, in the late 80s, I was on uh, the space shuttle program. And I worked on the space shuttle program. It was my very first assignment in the Air Force. And, oh, what a fun assignment. Oh, it was great. Really had fun with it. But then I watched the movie Armageddon. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's a fun movie. But if you've worked on the space shuttle, you kind of have to completely check your brain because they're doing things with that space shuttle that you just know, you can't do that. And I spent the whole movie going, you can't do that. You, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I'm sure my family probably got tired of me saying, can't do that. That won't work. But then there's other science fiction movies and you watch them and you go, hey, we could do that. We could totally do that. I can do that. So it really kind of depends. But I think for our customers, they kind of feel like some of this latest and greatest technology is science fiction. And they're just not sure. Can we really do that? Or can you not do that? And I think it's important for us to explain to our customers where we are in our storage, where we are in NVMe. And, and it's not science fiction at this point. So the other thing that's happened, and, and they've kind of got, the other thing that's happened with customers is they've gotten burnt on occasion. And, and I can relate to that. I remember in the early 1990s, I was managing a, a small group of engineers and we were designing this really, really cool computer. And the engineers came to me and they said, Mike, we've got this great idea. If you will just let us spend a quarter of a million dollars, we will buy this piece of software that's just going to make our lives fantastic. It's going to make our boards just go so much faster. It's going to save us so much time. It's going to be wonderful, Mike. It's called an auto router. And, oh, it's going to be great. Well, I was young and a little naive at the time. And I went, yeah, yeah, let's do that. This sounds great. Well, we bought the auto router and certainly the auto routers back in the early 1990s. Well, they didn't work so great. It didn't do what we thought it was going to do. We spent a lot of money and never really got any productivity out of it at all. 
So, so that's an example where customers are a little bit skittish to say, hey, I'm going to jump on board with that when is it really science fiction or is it not? And they actually have what they call a hype curve for these kind of technologies. So back in 2019, here's NVMe and NVMe over flash. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of highlighted right here, right there, highlighted. We're still, still going up to that peak of inflated expectation. Now, I don't think that's fair. I think we're a lot farther along than that. But, but our customers still might feel like, hey, that NVMe stuff, uh, I'm not quite so sure. So I think one of the important things that we need to do is we need to explain to our customers the real situation with NVMe. Where are we at? What are we doing? How far along are we? And we really do have solutions that aren't science fiction. So um, if I haven't totally discouraged you, let me, let me encourage you with this. There was also a report in 2019 from IDC saying that AFAs are all flash arrays they generated almost 80% of the primary external storage revenue. Well, that sounds great. And of course, we all understand what's so great about NVMe. Let me just briefly hit on that because my marketing people really wanted me to hit this topic. So we're going to. First of all, performance. NVMe is so much better than SATA or SAS because the interface is PCIe. So I get that great throughput and bandwidth and I get great speeds and really low latency. We're also getting much larger capacities now, and we're able to put things in such dense form factors. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. And with the improved cooling, boy, we can have great total cost of ownership. And the great thing about flash, of course, is there's no moving parts. It's not like spinning rust that has reliability issues. We have no moving parts, so reliability is a whole lot better. So let me show you what's gone on since 2014. And, and Supermicro jumped in that game in 2014. And boy, we've been just kind of waiting. Okay, this is going to really take off. It's great technology. And it is, but you can see we had a, pretty much a slow start, but we're expecting really good growth. On the left side of this slide, I want you to notice the form factors. Form factors are changing. The add-on card was the form factor at the time, way back when. And that is certainly shrinking down to where add-on cards are really not the way most people do NVMe. You'll notice that M.2, M.2 is pretty large, but it's expected to shrink down. And U.2 is expected to grow. But also notice this thing that's kind of up in that upper left or upper right corner, EDSFF. What's going on with that? And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So what's so great about NVMe? Let's talk about it. We talked about it from a hardware standpoint, but what about the software standpoint? Because the whole solution stack and the IO stack is really, really important to understand because that really gets in the way. The purpose of NVMe is to reduce that stack. So when you've got the stack associated with a hard drive, you've got about 10 milliseconds of time going through that huge stack. Well, it gets better if you have a SAS SSD. Get it down to 150 microseconds. Well, that's great. But with NVMe, we can really, really dramatically reduce the latency, dramatically reduce that stack and get it down to less than 10 microseconds. So that is super important because we're directly connected to that CPU. And now that CPU scales, the number of drive scales with the number of lanes that CPU provides. And that's super important to me. And that's where I'm going to jump into more is better. CPUs now are getting to the point where they're getting more and more PCI lanes, and this is fantastic. I'm showing a diagram here of what we can do today with a, with a pretty standard um, CPU kind of system. But in the future, as we grow more and more PCI lanes, and even some CPUs that are out there today that have more PCI lanes, we can do so much better. Because imagine, one of the things about what you're seeing here is this is not a balanced design. And what I mean by that is I've got 32 lanes going to drives and only 16 lanes going to network. So my bottleneck is going to be in that network because it's not perfectly balanced. So these are things that we can improve on as we get more lanes. The other thing that's happening is PCIe Gen 4. So Gen 4 is going to give us twice the amount of bandwidth as Gen 3. So that's fantastic. Now we can do even cooler things, faster things with better bandwidth. And certainly as we go to Gen 5, Gen 6, Gen 7, that was 
just about a month ago, I was in, I was in a, a training class about Gen 6. So it's coming. All of these things are coming. Um, and those are going to allow us to have much better designs. If you remember my discussion for anybody that saw my speech last year, it was all about how can we utilize these PCIe lanes, given that there really aren't that many for what we'd really like. So this is going to get better and more is definitely better. So what can we do with all of those lanes? As we grow, and even today, the, the systems that we can build are really pretty phenomenal. We can now put 32 drives into a 1U form factor box. Well, that's fantastic. Why is that so great? Because if I can get a 32 terabyte drive, and I've got 32 of them, I can put a petabyte into a 1U box. And that's been my goal, gosh, for three years now. A petabyte in a 1U. I've been talking about it, I've been saying it, and I'm still waiting for that 32 terabyte drive. And most people think, well, yeah, we can do that now because of EDSFF. And that certainly helps. That form factor allows us to fit 32 drives in a 1U. But honestly, about two years ago or so, I already designed a U.2 version that allows you to have 32 drives in, in a 1U box, even with U.2 drives. So we can do great things, pack a whole lot of, of density of drives into a pretty small form factor. So some of the advantages, of course, of having that petascale type of, of system is we can get obviously more capacity, go faster, less power, less space. I, I recently responded to an RFI, 230 petabytes of flash. Well, how do you fit 230 petabytes? Well, with a system like this, if I can get to a petabyte in a 1U, well, that really shrinks down the amount of space, which reduces my total cost of ownership. It allows me to also have architectures that have high performance and low latency. And with NVMe over fabric, which we'll talk about later, we'll have disaggregation, which is also a great feature. And with all of this, I can have hot pluggable drives right out the front. So that's a real huge advantage. And there are thermal advantages too, that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So another thing that you can do now is have a JBOF. You may say, well, what's a JBOF? I'm familiar with JBODs. Those are just a bunch of drives. But what's a JBOF? Well, whereas a JBOD interfaces with SAS and allows you to connect with a SAS controller out to a box just full of drives with a SAS interface, a JBOF allows us to interface directly with PCIe. So now I can send PCIe cables and signals to this box and connect to those drives and have a direct interface to those drives. You'll notice, maybe if you look close to this box, you'll notice there's no processors, there's no memory. It is literally just a bunch of flash, a bunch of flash drives. So these are some of the things we can now do with these cool technologies. And with that, with the JBOF, I can now interface more than just one server. I can have multiple servers. I can have two host servers or four host servers or even eight host servers, servers accessing that JBOF. And with that, it opens up some really great applications. Certainly high throughput ingest. If I just have a whole bunch of data coming in, I can store it very, very quickly in that flash JBOF. Also, if I need high density, hot storage. What a great application for that. And, and certainly data analytics, which is becoming a much bigger deal now. Imagine if you're Netflix or Hulu or anybody that has to deliver content. This is a great application where I have great storage and, and I, I wish that Netflix would buy this because then I would never have to wait for a movie to load. It would be great. So some really cool applications that we can do with these type of things. So that talks about the box, but now let's start going down into the component, the actual drives. What's going on there? So let's talk about NVMe form factors. Everybody's pretty used to a U.2 form factor. U.2 is very common, two and a half inch form factor. Very, very common, everybody's used to that. And also M.2s. M.2s, great little small little device that allows us to put flash on a nice little small M.2. One of the challenges with M.2 is it's not hot pluggable. Well, that's kind of something that most of our customers really want to be able to do. Now, you'll also notice I put an NF1 here. 
I did that. Samsung created this. It's kind of end of life -y. Um, they decided to not proceed with it because there was kind of a war between NF1 and, and EDSFF short. And it looks as though EDSFF short has won that battle. But Samsung came out with a great product with the NF1. So then you'll notice EDSFF short or E1.S is very similar to that, slightly different connector. One of the things Samsung was trying to do is maintain that same kind of M.2 compatibility, whereas EDSFF doesn't do that. And then we have the EDSFF long, or what's known as a ruler. And, and that can fit a whole lot more capacity of, of chips and DRAM, so we can get a lot larger drives. So these are the form factors that we've got. So you may ask, well, wait a minute, where did all this EDSFF come from? So let's talk about that for a second. EDSFF was created by a group of 15 companies. They all work together. Um, to create this industry standard for the connector, for the form factor, and they wanted to optimize it for NVMe. If you use a two and a half inch U.2 drive, that's really optimized for spinning rust. It's meant for hard drives. What's the point of keeping that form factor when it's really not optimal for what we have going with flash? And we can also make things that are a lot more operationally more efficient, denser, and much cooler, and I'll show you that in just a second. The connector for EDSF is kind of cool. It's expandable. You've got a by four connector, which is what most people uh, think about when we're talking about NVMe drives, because it's four lanes that usually occurs with an NVMe drive. So the by four connector works great for that. But also in that one U form factor, we can fit a by eight connector. And the BI-8 connector has got some interesting applications that we could do because we could have um, two ports of BI-4, for example. That's a, an interesting application. And if we can go to a 2U form factor, well, now we can use the BI-16. So there's expansion and capabilities with EDSFF so that you can design things that will have more purpose than just NVMe. Now you may say, well, what am I going to do with the BI-16? Well, imagine, instead of just thinking about drives what if i wanted to have what if i wanted to have a nit card that i could plug into the front in that same form factor as as an edsff drive or what if i wanted to have an fpga or some sort of processing unit this is where by eights by 16s will come in handy and i think the really really key thing about edsff is it is pcie gen 4 and gen 5 ready this is key why is it so key? Because there's a lot of engineers that have looked at U.2 and said, you know, it's just not going to make Gen 4, or I mean Gen 5. It could do Gen 4. It's not going to make Gen 5. Now, there's an argument going on. Some engineers are like, well, I could get that to work, and I'm sure they could. But really, U.2 really doesn't work well with Gen 5, whereas EDSFF does. And I think when we start going to PCIe Gen 5, that's where you're going to see EDSFF really take off and thrive because U.2 is just not going to cut it. So, so let me tell you about one of the biggest advantages of EDSFF. It's the cooling. When you design a U.2, you have to have a backplane. And that's what this, on the left-hand side, you'll see that red board. That's a backplane. And the problem with a, a U.2 backplane is it's a huge air dam. It goes right across the front of my server and it blocks the airflow. If you've ever designed one of these things, one of the first things you do is you try to cut as many holes as you possibly can in that board so I can get as much airflow back to my processors and my memory and all of those things that can get kind of hot and I really want to cool and I really wish I didn't have this air dam that's blocking all of my airflow. With EDSFF, we take that, that air dam and we fold it down flat. Now there's no blockage, there's no air dam. The back plane is now flat and I use right angle connectors and with those, those, those right angle vertical connectors, I can then plug in my drives which are just as wide as the connector and allow the air to flow right past those drives and right to the back of the system it significantly improves my thermals in the back of the system. So now I can have much better airflow. 
much better airflow means I can slow down my fans. I can, and that will save me on a lot of power. It takes a lot of power to power up a fan. And as you're trying to increase airflow, it's not linear. It takes more and more and more and more power to power a fan. So if I can slow my fans down, I can save significant amount of power. I can also make it quieter. If you've ever been in a loud data center, they could be really loud. Imagine if I can slow that down. So now my total cost of ownership gets significantly reduced because of the amount of power. And yet I can have all of the high performance, the hot plug ability, and the capacities that I want with a lot less power. You may ask, well, how much less power? Well, let's look at what we need in the way of airflow. Intel did this study. They took a, a ruler, they, one of their own rulers and one of their own drives, and they compared them. And what it showed is that they could save up to 55% less airflow by using an EDSFF design instead of a U.2 design. And it all has to do with that air dam that's blocking things. So it's a significant improvement in airflow, which means a significant reduction in price of what the total cost of ownership is gonna be for power. And you may say, wow, this sounds fantastic. EDSFF is awesome and it's gonna take over the world. And I really think it will. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So the original spec for EDSFF long, it was a nine and a half millimeter thick drive. That sounds great. And I designed to that and you can fit 32 of them in the front and that's fantastic and it's awesome. But sure enough, someone came along and said, well, what if I wanted to dissipate more power? What if I just care more about cooling than I do about density? What if I don't need 32 drives? Only 16 drives would be fine for me. And they came up with an 18 millimeter wide. It has, the drive itself has the same capacity. It's just wider, so it can't be quite as dense, but it gives you much better cooling. For some people, that's really important. For others, it's not. So now we have this choice, nine and a half or 18. Not a big deal, there's only two. And fortunately, they're both symmetric. So in some situations, you can actually put an 18 millimeter drive into a system designed for nine and a half. But let's talk about EDSFF short. It started off as 5.9 millimeters, and sure enough, Supermicro being on the cutting edge, we designed to that 5.9. But then someone came along and said, oh no, there should be an eight millimeter. Oh no, we should have 9.5, and that way we can match what a long is. I mean, we may as well match that. And then someone else said, well, no, I did a full study of thermals, and 15 millimeter is so much better. And not only that, but 15 millimeter is what we use when we do... Uh, you got two drives, so that kind of makes sense. Someone else came along and said, oh, no, no, we need 25 millimeters. We need a whole lot more cooling if we're going to put FPGAs and, and uh, computational storage and cool things like that. Don't we need a lot more? Well, now I've got five different options. Here's the problem. If I am a drive vendor and I make drives, which one do I make? I've got five different choices. Which one's gonna win? Which one's gonna work best for my customer? Who knows? And if I'm a system designer like me, I design these systems, well, which one do I design to? I can probably design it so it'll handle the 5.9 and the 9.5. That'll work out pretty well. It's nice and symmetric. But the minute I start going into asymmetric enclosures like the 15 and the 25, all bets are off. Now I'm like, okay, how do I design it to to do more than one. So there's a decision to make, and it's actually causing, I think, a lot of confusion in the industry. And because of that, a lot of people are just not doing anything. I'm not gonna design it because I don't know which one to design. Now, we're not quite done yet. Nope, there's another one called the ESFF3, E3. This is a three inch form factor. And I heard, a, a, I heard who thought of this idea, and I think they were actually, they were thinking kind of smart from the standpoint of, like we said, our customers, they're slow to move. They like to do things very consistently. If, if I have a customer that always buys a 2U 24 drive box, they may want to have a 2U 24 drive box. Well, with E3, that gives me a form factor that looks a whole lot like a two and a half inch U.2 drive. So I can give them EDSFF and all the benefits of EDSFF, but make it look just like a U.2 
two and a half inch drive, and therefore they can go, okay, I feel comfortable. It's my 2U24 drive system. That's what I feel comfortable with. So from that standpoint, it makes sense. But of course, other people came along and said, well, maybe we should make a short version and then make a long version. And, and of course the width, maybe seven and a half would be good or the 16.8 and where they came up with 16.8, I honestly don't know. Cause it's like, wait a minute, even a normal U.2 is a 15 millimeter drive. So 16.8 seems kind of like, I'm sure you can still probably get 24 drives in there. So once again, there's confusion. And I think the confusion is causing people to hesitate, causing the developers to hesitate on what we're going to do with EDSFF because we don't know where to go from there. So we've talked about systems. We've talked about the drives themselves. Now let's talk a little bit about, let's go one step farther and go into the flash. What's going on with flash? Well, the latest thing in Flash is QLC. You may say, well, what's QLC? Well, let me explain. It's how many bits I can store into a single cell of my memory, my Flash memory. Originally, we had SLC. That was a single bit. Then we had MLC, which was multi-bit. Well, multi sounds like more than two, but it was really only two bits. Then we had TLC for three, TLC, three bits, and Q for quad, so now we can have four bits per cell. Well, the great thing about that is as I go from three bits per cell to four bits per cell, I get 33% higher capacity. So higher capacity improvement. And that's great because what that's gonna do is it's gonna reduce my cost. If I can make in the same amount of flash space, same silicon, 33% higher capacity, then I can drop the cost of my drives. And that's the idea. Because the real, one of the big things that we've been all pushing for in Flash is how can we close this price gap between hard drives and solid state drives? And that's another problem that a lot of customers have. They have this thought that, oh, I can't possibly have a solid state drive. It's way too expensive. Well, solid state drive prices are really dropping. And at this point, if you look at a 15K or a 10K hard drive, they're actually more expensive in solid state drives. So you can get better performance. We've actually started closing that gap. Now, once we get down to the really, really inexpensive consumer, that's gonna be a little bit more challenging, but that's where we're heading to. Now, with QLC though, some things you gotta consider. Um, first of all, uh, the EDSFF QLC that Intel's created has 16K block rights. So you've gotta think about that on how you're gonna use that device. We're used to 4K block writes. Think of it, if you were to do 4K block writes, you would have to write that four times. And so that's gonna impact your performance. If you really wanna do 16K block writes. The other thing important to know about QLC is those writes are a lot slower. They're significantly slower. Now the reads are the same, have the same read performance. So you can read it just as fast as a TLC drive, but you're gonna write it slower. The other thing is endurance. The endurance of a QLC drive is less than the endurance of a, of a TLC drive. They're about a half of a drive write per day. Now, endurance, though, is important to think about because you've got, you can't just look at endurance by itself. One drive write per day, a half drive write per day. Let's just take an example here. If I've got an eight terabyte drive that has one drive write per day, you may say, well, I'm, I'm good with one drive write. Well, you can write then eight terabytes every day, okay? But imagine if I've got a 16 terabyte drive that's QLC that has a half drive write per day, well, I can still write eight terabytes every day. So there really isn't much difference in how much you can write. Now, if I've got a box, a, a, a system, a storage system, that can fit a half a petabyte of flash in a 1U, well, how often am I going to write a half a petabyte of data? Am I going to do that every day? So if not, then maybe half drive write per day is fine. So you've got to consider when you think of endurance, you also have to take into consideration the capacity of the drive because what really matters is how much data can I write every day? So when it comes to QLC drives, one of the things that we can come to the conclusion of is you really, really want to use these for read intensive applications. An example, 
I'll use Netflix again. If I'm Netflix, I write that data of that movie onto the drive once, and then my customers read it and read it and read it and read it multiple times. So that's a great application where you're gonna write it once and read it multiple times. GPUs can have some of those applications too, where you're gonna read the data once, or you're gonna write it once, and you're gonna read it a whole bunch of times to train. So that's another application where you've got read intensive kind of, kind of usage. Write intensive, you're better off sticking with the TLC. So we talked about the systems, we talked about the devices, we talked about the flash. Let's go back and start talking about the infrastructure network. How can we improve that? Because we're making all of this faster, 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 but I think we better consider that network and what we're gonna do there. So this is why we're gonna move into talking about why and be the over fabric. So let's talk about it first. Before I explain what NVMe over fabric is, let's talk about where the bottlenecks are. Now back, I say back in the day, we have it today. If I were to have 24 SATA hard drives, I could use those 24 SATA hard drives to saturate a 10 gigabit ethernet. Now, if I've got 40 gigabit, it'll take 100 drives to saturate that. And if I've got 100 gigabit ethernet, well, it's gonna take 250 SATA drives to saturate um, 100 gigabit. So you're saying, see, I, the problem right now is I just can't get enough drives. That's what's going on with hard drives. The minute we go move and change that to a SATA solid state drive, well, it only takes two drives to saturate 10 gig, nine drives for the 40, and 24 drives for 100 gigabit ethernet. So now we're starting to shrink. But what happens if I move to SAS? Well, with SAS, I can saturate that that 10 gigabit link in just one drive and that 100 gig in 10 drives. So what we're getting to now is the bottleneck is occurring in the network. All of a sudden, we're moving from those hard drives to our flash where now I don't have enough network for my drives. Now, we haven't even hit NVMe. When we go to NVMe, that 10 gig link, it's saturated by a single drive and four NVMe drives will saturate a 100 gigabit network. So now the bottleneck is becoming in the network and we need to think about how can we improve that fabric, that network fabric to transfer data much, much faster. That's where NVMe over fabrics comes into play. We need to extend that NVMe efficiency over the fabric. What we really wanna do so we wanna have it so that a local drive, something that's completely connected right to our CPU, has the same sort of latency and performance as if it was across the, the ethernet or, yeah, ethernet. <laughs> so we wanna create a command structure that'll allow us to transfer end to end, all the way from our target to our host, back and forth over ethernet. The best thing to do though, is to bypass that legacy stack. That, that legacy stack that has all of that software in it is just going to slow us down. So what was done first is RDMA. If you use RDMA, we can avoid the processor, we can avoid that stack, and we can transfer data from drive to drive directly. And you can see we can significantly improve the, improve the performance. We can go from an iSCSI at 400 microseconds, a local drive would be about 80 microseconds, well, you can do NVMe over fabric with RDMA at about 100 microseconds. So it's very close to the performance of having a directly connected drive. And likewise, if we move to TCP IP, you can also do it with TCP IP and get really decent performance. So what we're trying to do here and what we're trying to show is if we can use NVMe over fabrics, now we can reduce that latency that happens over the fabric, reduce it down to where now I can have drives over an, a network and yet get that same performance. So whether I'm directly connected or over a network, whether that be fiber channel, RDMA or TCP IP, I can improve that network speed and, and reduce that latency. So now we've got the ability to use different kinds of protocols, different kinds of fabrics to be able to do that. Because what we're finding is, is the cost of doing this is, is really the data in motion. 
So that's what's really important here. And we need to get that latency down and avoid the protocol overhead. So let's talk about something. If we can do that, now we can move on to a composable infrastructure. And what we mean by that, I'll, I'll show you an example. In a typical compute kind of situation, you've got the drives sitting in your compute nodes. So you have all these drives distributed across your compute nodes. If I need more storage, I just buy another compute node that has more storage. But why should I have to do that? If I don't need more compute, I just need more storage, why do we need to buy more compute? So the idea is, is we can disaggregate the compute from the storage. And how we would do that is take all those drives out of the compute nodes and, I, and consolidate them into storage nodes. The only way you're gonna be able to do that well though is with NVMe over Fabric that allows you to reduce that latency that's gonna occur. Because people are like, ooh, I don't wanna do that. That's gonna add latency as I go use my network to access those drives. But if I can reduce that latency and get high bandwidth, now I've got something going where I can disaggregate my storage from my compute. And if we have the right tools to do this, consider that maybe we don't even need processors in memory inside those boxes. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. If we can go directly from network directly to the drives using, Apple, using hardware that's developed today that I'm showing here, then we can do that without even having compute. Well, wait a minute. That's exactly what we were talking about when we were talking about that JBOF earlier. It didn't have processors in memory. It just had drives. So how can we take that JBOF and make it into an NVMe over fabric JBOF. Well, let's talk about that. This is the exact same JBOF that we were talking about before. 32 drives in a 1U in a way cool JBOF. Well, now if I add like a Bluefield card from Mellanox, I can take that interface, the Bluefield card handles that NVMe over fabric interface. I can plug in 100 gigabit ethernet into the Bluefield card and it will directly access those drives. Direct, no CPU involved. That's what I mean by direct. No memory, no CPU. And now I can have a disaggregated box where if I need more storage, I can buy more of these systems so that I can have more and more storage without adding any more to my compute. So this is a great solution that'll allow me to expand and allow me to make it so that, that that cost of data at rest, which is no longer the issue, it's much more, how can I get data to go fast? That's where the value is. How can I get to my data quickly? So now we can expand and grow from having tens of drives to hundreds of drives to 10,000s of drives by using NVMe over Fabric to do that without expanding the latency. And of course, our SSDs are becoming faster and faster and faster as we get to newer technologies like 3D Crosspoint. So this has become even more useful. So now we've got NVMe over Fabric. It reduces our latency. What's a great application that we can use a similar sort of thing? Well, one of them I already brought up was GPUs. GPUs need to have a lot of data. They need to do all of the training, inferencing. They need to do all of these kind of cool things, but all of that takes data. You need to have this information going to the GPU. But in a standard configuration today, what happens is it goes from the drive through a switch, goes off to the CPU, to the memory, down to the GPU, and then back up and around and back to the drive. Well, what if we could cut out the, G the CPU and the memory, similar to what we did on NVMe over Fabrics, and be able to go directly from the GPU right to the drive, right through that switch. And that's what GPU direct storage does. It allows us to go directly from the GPU right to the drive. But we can take it a step farther. Imagine that we take that over a fabric. So now we put in a NIC and, and allow us to go Normally, what would happen is we would have to go from the GPU, through the CPUs, through the NIC, and off to the drive. And then when you want to expand that, you've got to have multiple NICs to, to deal with all of this, and you're going through and, and you're going through that software stack that's inside that, that uh, CPU. You want to cut that out. 
So this kind of shows what happens without uh, GPU Direct. You would go from this step one, this memory, you've got uh, memory with the data in your memory, it goes through the CPU, goes through, comes all the way out, goes back over to this NIC, goes through your CPU, through your memory, down to your GPU. But we can improve that with GPU Direct, where now our storage drives can directly access through here, go through that NIC, and now we can cut out the CPU and go directly into the GPU. So as you can see, GPU Direct, very similar to what we did with NVMe over Fabric, we can cut out the GPU by using RDMA to access the data, to get the data to go through without the CPU. Much better approach at doing things. So that's our GPUs. Let me wrap this whole thing up. First of all, NVMe, it's on the move with innovation. We are um, growing NVMe. It's changing, it's growing. And it's important that we show our customers that with this growth and with the changes that, that these products are real. They've been around for a long, long time. Processors, they're enabling better NVMe systems as we have faster PCIe and as we have more PCIe lanes. Uh, EDSFF, it is going to take over the world. I'm convinced. It's going to take over the world. But it's only going to do that if we can settle down on that spec. We really need to narrow down what are the drives that, that the drive vendors need to make and what are the drives that our system guys need to design to. NVMe over Fabric, it really enables that low latency transfer of data. And, and this isn't one where it really surprises me. I have a lot of customers that they, they design, they, they wanna buy a system from me, they've got all the tools that they need, a, a CX-5 card sitting in the system. And I'm like, well, then you're going to use NVMe over Fabric, right? And they're like, no, no, that sounds really complicated. That sounds really hard. This is, the, the, this is what we need to get our customers to get over. Is It's not complicated. It's not hard. We have applications that can do that. We even have software-defined storage companies like Accelero, Extend, uh, Wicca.io have got some great products out there that allow you to do all of that NVMe over Fabric application without having to figure out how to do it and get great performance. And with GPU Direct, now we can use those same kind of concepts to get that data right to the GPUs, avoiding the CPU. And most importantly, and if I haven't gotten this across, our customers need to understand this is not science fiction. This is real. These products have been around for a long, long time. Our 1U32 system, I designed that well over two years ago. It's been working great. It's not science fiction. It's real stuff. And it really does work. And just so you know, because, hey, I've got to say this. Supermicro has products for every one of these things. Everything I've talked about so far in my discussion, we have products that do all of this because Supermicro is on the cutting edge. It's the best part about working at Supermicro. You get to work on the cutting edge stuff. So we have those things. We have well over 150 systems that all use NVMe. Thank you so much. Uh, here's the disclaimer so that we can disclaim. Read that. There will be a test. And thank you. I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed this conversation that we had so talk. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Goodbye.